Good evening, and welcome to this special evening as part of the McLeod Lecture Series. The McLeod Lecture Series honors the late Bill McLeod, who served with distinction as a district judge as well as a legislator. McLeod, who died in 2003, was an honors graduate of Lake Charles High School and attended McNeese State University. McLeod was a distinguished public servant who served 23 years in the Louisiana State Legislature. Each year, the series focuses on timely as well as historical aspects of Louisiana politics and efforts to promote a climate of good government. The 12th presentation of the series brings our community to a milestone anniversary. 2015 marks the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Rita. We have four panelists who will be sharing their experiences and areas of expertise as it connects to the fabric of Southwest Louisiana. I'll do a quick introduction with each and then we'll get straight to questions. We'll start with Philip Scooter Trosclair. He currently serves as program manager at Rockefeller Wildlife Refuge. Scooter worked 13 years with the alligator program statewide, tagging over half of a million alligators that were returned back into the wild. This program is modeled worldwide as a conservation success story for other wildlife programs. Scooter also serves as commissioner and vice president on the Chenier Plain Coastal Restoration and Protection Authority for Southwest Louisiana and on the Cameron Parish Gravity Drainage Board in District 5. He advocates for restoration projects focusing more along the coastline. Next, thank you. Yeah. Next, we have Paul Rainwater. He most recently held the title as Governor Jindal's Chief of Staff. He resigned in February 2014 to pursue a career in the private sector. Paul has also served as Executive Director of the Louisiana Recovery Authority and Legislative Director COO for U.S. Senator Mary Landrieu and is Chief Administrative Officer for the City of Lake Charles. From June 2006 to January 2007, he served as Director of Hazard Mitigation and Intergovernmental Affairs at the LRA where he managed program policies, served as team leader, and coordinated with state and federal agencies to set mitigation priorities. <laughs> Ryan Boriak serves as parish administrator for the Cameron Parish Police Jury. He has also served as associate administrator, which allowed him the opportunity to administer all state and federal grant programs totaling nearly $200 million and providing strength and stability to Cameron Parish post hurricanes Rita and Ike. Ryan holds several board of director seats, including the Chenier Plain Coastal Restoration and Protection Authority. And David Phillips is a retired U.S. Army Intelligence Operations Officer who has served 37 years, both active duty as well as civilian. For 34 years, he served as a member of the U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary. David has been a Federal Emergency Management Agency Reserve employee since 2005, and post-Hurricane Rita, he functioned as an intergovernmental affairs liaison to coastal parishes and as director of the FEMA Southwest Louisiana Area Field Office, overseeing both the public assistance and individual assistance programs. And as we talk about FEMA Day, we'll go ahead and get started with you. Um, in, in the days, weeks, months, even years to follow both Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, of course, FEMA had, there were a lot of questions from people about how FEMA handled the recovery efforts. Tell us about what those questions were, some of that criticism, and, and where we've come since then. Well, obviously, uh, we recognized some problems, I would say, with uh, the response to Katrina. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, Congress undertook a top-to-bottom look at FEMA. And uh, this is a 60-page brief synopsis of the changes that have occurred in FEMA since Rita. And it's not just the post-Katrina Management Act. It's, I like to think of it as the Rita-Katrina. We like to put Rita up front. And also Wilma was involved with that, too. So. I've gone through and tried to just highlight a couple of things that may be of interest uh, from the top down. Uh, right now, FEMA has uh, recovery offices in, in Louisiana, permanent recovery offices in Louisiana, Mississippi, Texas, and Alabama. And Florida has already had, had one there. Uh, we have full uh, incident management assistance teams 
There are three at the national level now that are ready to deploy within two hours. We have one at each regional uh, office and with two actually at the regions uh, six and four, which of course cover the Gulf Coast. Uh, we've done a lot of things to try to maximize the amount of housing. Housing seems to be, it, it, very, it became very clear from day one that housing was going to be a big issue with us here, and FEMA's done quite a bit as far as how they're managing the housing, uh, temporary housing situation even to the point where FEMA is now authorized to go in and actually conduct repairs of rental properties to make them available and put them in the housing pool. Uh, you'll, you'll, you hear the term partnering a lot now in FEMA. We have partners all the way from the individual that sits at a desk with uh, serving a, a, a disaster uh, survivor all the way to the very top. And they really, uh, uh, that's, that's just one of the, the things that we do full time nowadays. Um, there's a lot of other changes. I'd encourage anybody that would like to get into the details to see me after, I'll be happy to share this with you. <laughs> oh, I know one of the ways that I first was able to talk to you in the, the days following Brito was um, at a FEMA trailer park. These were a, a big eyesore for some in the community, but of course serves a huge role in that temporary housing need. Tell us, um, what did you learn about the, using the FEMA trailers and the different, uh, different parks, the different community centers that allowed the FEMA trailers? Well, one, one thing is uh, that, that's pretty obvious now, there won't be any more travel trailers, is what we hear anymore. No more little FEMA boxes. Uh, FEMA still has to use, in certain situations, of course, the larger uh, uh, mobile home units. Uh, they also experiment with, uh, with uh, different kinds of uh, assistance depending on the area they're going into, like there's a little uh, tent type of thing called a yurt, which uh, they've had some, pro uh, some uh, experience with that they're trying to work, and some other uh, housing uh, experiments that they're running in different areas to see how that will work out. Because there's never enough rental housing after a storm, particularly like we had here, uh, to, to serve everyone, so uh, that becomes a great big problem for us. And when we're talking about uh, mass evacuations that happen with those storms, can you talk about the new family and child locator system that has been developed since then? That's one of the things that we uh, that, that became obvious uh, that trying to locate family members was a big problem, and children, unattended children, uh, particularly more in the Katrina side than, than over here, uh, but that there's a new locator um, uh, system that's been uh, put put into service. Uh, it also takes advantage of all the new modern technologies uh, such as your, um, well, your computer-based technologies. And uh, while we're on that subject, the family members now also includes the family pet or service animals. I was asked a question earlier about what about the, the um, livestock situation, and I guess if you call them your pets, uh, we might be able to take care of those and put them somewhere. <laughs> Give them a name. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us how um, the tax base of certain communities could affect what assistance comes to them. In, in a lot of the smaller uh, communities that, are, that, that, that are, are hit with a disaster, it wipes out just about the whole tax base of the community. If you think about some of the, uh, the tornadoes, for example, up north, uh, and of course the tax base is important because that's how the, the employees and the, get, uh, get paid and everything else. FEMA now has a program where they can assist with a grant, with grants for those communities that, uh, that have lost, basically lost their tax base. Thank you, sir. We'll go to Ryan now and it's hard to talk about Cameron Parish when we talk about Rita and still not reference Audrey. So let's talk about um, how cyclical some of the changes can be when it comes to recovery, building back, coming back to Cameron Parish. Well, Brittany, I have to say that in my generation, Audrey was always the storm. Uh, June 27, 1957 is something that was very well chronicled. Uh, the historical documents were there, just the stories of the families of, of how the storm came and impacted the, all of the individuals in, in Lower Cameron Parish. Um, but they immediately went back to their home, what we, co we consider their home place, uh, and lived in tents provided by the Red Cross. 
Uh, they, provi they provided meals for their families and they worked with their extended families to repair the homes one at a time mm -hmm. uh, per family. For us, uh, Audrey was the storm and we had a pretty good run before that next named storm impacted Cameron in you know, 48 years. Um, we were always taught about the, the power and strength of water and to respect the Gulf of Mexico with all of the natural abundance that she provides to Cameron Parish, you also have to admire her strength. Uh, for Rita, one thing that was very interesting to me is that the devastation that the individuals saw following Rita uh, was much more prevalent and widespread than it was post Audrey. So even though the structural damage was greater, I think our, our families and our residents came back stronger due to the fact that there was not as much life loss. Uh, it makes it a little bit easier to deal with uh, structural damages when you still have each other. And when you're, when you're discussing identifying your pets and your family members and things like that, um, there are some stories that my family members couldn't talk about. And that was pulling up to a dock uh, along the Calcasieu River having to identify their deceased family members. That's one thing that um, we are blessed that we did not have to do to the same extent in Cameron. Following Audrey, the economy came back. The, the oil and gas industry boomed. And then as we know in the 80s, it, it busted. Uh, I didn't know that. Somebody told me that. <laughs> I was barely born then, but I'm dating myself. But, uh, so here we fast forward and then we have Rita in 2005, uh, following Rita, again, there is somewhat of an economic renaissance going on in Cameron Parish. So you have a detrimental impact event, and then you have a community that, by the grace of God, uh, has positioned itself to capitalize on some uh, abundance of natural resource and some industrial development in the parish. Very good. Well. Tell me, when it comes to uh, what you were talking about, a very powerful story about, uh, about what Cameron natives had to do in the days following Audrey, how do you feel that that impacted their response to Rita? Um, quite frankly, I think it, it, it very well prepared them uh, to handle a storm. Our family, we were always taught to evacuate. You run from the water. You can't run from the wind. So if a tropical storm was in the Gulf and it was approaching Cameron, we would evacuate. You take the pictures and the videos and you load up in the vehicle and you go. Um, I, I think one of, the, one of the major differences was the, the lag time. You know, uh, you expect to recover more quickly. Uh, we all want it more expeditious. Sometimes you can't have it that way. Um, but I think that post Audrey, um, individuals were building back the way they had previously constructed. And we had a good run, as I mentioned, uh, of 48 years without being severely impacted again. However, post Rita, it was very clear, um, not only in Cameron Parish, but in many coastal parishes uh, across the Gulf of Mexico, that building codes and elevation requirements would be something that uh, needed to be uh, looked at more in depth. Mm -hmm. It was very difficult in Cameron Parish uh, to try and convince individuals of what they should do on their private property. It was very difficult uh, for us, for the, for the governmental agencies at the time, the local government, FEMA and GOSEP, uh, there needed to be a partnership because education was a, was a major, uh, major impact to the, to the residents. Um, but I think that Ike illustrated to a very visual people why elevation and building codes were a necessary evil. Uh, those who had come back post Rita and built in the same manner as they had constructed their homes pre-Rita were damaged again by Hurricane Ike. So the proof was in the pudding, uh, so to speak, following Ike. Uh, those individuals who had built back to code, to elevation, um, and it showed because the parish already in three years, as devastated as the parish was, it recovered much, much more quickly. Very good. Scooter, let's go to you now. Um, one of the few employers in Lower Cameron Parish is the refuge there. 
Tell us how the days and weeks following Rita, how, how were y'all able to stay operational? Were you able to stay operational and where are you today? Yeah, we, uh, we, we stayed operational. Uh, it was very difficult, but we had the state that supported our employees. You know, most of every employee that existed there or worked at the refuge was impacted and lost their homes. Uh, uh, and so, you know, everybody's displaced and we were fortunate uh, to begin getting the calls very quickly that even though they were displaced, they were ready to come back to work. And <clears throat> with that, teams were put together and we helped with recoveries. Uh, we partnership with the other agencies that were out there and because of the expertise we had in that nature uh, or that environment, uh, our crew was probably the best ones to be out there. We had airboat drivers. Uh, we, we, uh, it was the only way to get to some of the uh, search and rescues, if any existed, as well as uh, recognizing some of these buildings and, and recovering you know, whatever people could, uh, because most of everyone had lost everything. Uh, we are now probably one of the the most important employers down there besides the parish and, and you know with oil and gas it's it's up and down but for a person to have a steady position uh, they look towards us but the problem we end up facing are the applicant pools are very small to meet civil service credentials and and so uh, pay scales are needed to be adjusted a lot of these people that are coming in that are applying are an hour away, you know. Uh, even though there were locals at one time uh, to, to be employed, they, they're driving back and forth, a, you know, a day and over an hour. So uh, it's, it's very hard to compensate through the state system to justify to meet some of that, that, that gap. So what would you feel is the solution to that? Yeah, the, the solution is, uh, is hopefully to have the rebuilding uh, process come in, and, and it, but it's it, you know as they mentioned that the restrictions are, are very tough, uh, uh, but we know that's if we're going to make it through the next one, that's what's got to happen. Uh, it's hard to face. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, it. It's 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 very hard for people to come back to the life they were, they once knew, and I think you look at the generation now versus. Hurricane Audrey, you had so many people and families that were tied to the land. Okay, you, you had fishermen and crabbers and uh, cattle production, plus oil and gas. Uh, they knew nothing else. They had to come back. But now uh, a lot of that culture has changed and, 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 and you still have some of the heritage just brought down to the next generation and the, and the property has a, a lot of these these uh, older generations are gone now and and the property has been passed on but you don't have the way of life that's tied into the property uh, but they still hold on to it they can't let it go and and I admit I'm, I'm one of them I mean this is family land it's very important but uh, it's tough it, it's going to be tough to fully recover it, it's slow uh, hopefully the, the, uh, the oil and gas will be the savior, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the culture is, is hanging on by a thread due to coastal impacts and, and just natural uh, processes. Mm -hmm. uh, that's hard to recover from as well. Well, on a day-to-day -day basis, tell me with the smaller staff, as y'all are still looking to fill some positions, how do y'all shift the resources? What does a day in your life look like to still get the job done? Yes, it, it's, you know, Rockefeller Wildlife Refuge was, was known for the research activities that took place, uh, again, with the alligator program and, and so forth as one, uh, but also for endangered species from pelicans, eagles, and, and so forth. So when you begin to conduct all these research projects and, and you're trying to hire research staff uh, to fill a position kind of in the middle of nowhere, no shopping malls, no grocery store, uh, gas station way down the road, you know, it's just uh, no place to fix your car or maintenance anything. You learn how to do it on your own. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it's tough, but 
we do have staff that try to fill the gaps, but a lot of things that are going on, we have to either contract out or bring equipment to be fixed and repaired, uh, which takes a lot of time out of the projects. Yeah. So. All right, Scooter. All right, Paul. Uh, of course, in, in the immediate time following a catastrophic event like Rita, people need immediate help. They need the, the short-term solutions to problems. But part of your role was looking at the long-term solutions. Tell us about that. Thank you, uh, Brittany. One of my jobs right after the storm, I'd gone to work for the Louisiana Recovery Authority was in the, as Director of Hazard Mitigation. And the role of the Hazard Mitigation Director in a, in a situation like this is to look at long-term planning see how we can build back uh, in a resilient way. I mean, resiliency is such a buzzword, right? I mean, the reality of it is, and I'm from Southwest Louisiana, folks in Southwest Louisiana are pretty resilient people. And uh, we're pretty headstrong about, you know, how they want to build back. But the nature of these storms, I think, taught us a lot about what we needed to do next and the way we plan our communities and the way that, you know, we elevate our homes and the way we, you know, put roof straps on our roofs, the way we put our windows in, the way we, we want to have a, a home down in Cameron to have washouts in the bottom, just different things, different strategies in order to survive a storm. And so I did about 100 public hearings as the director of hazard mitigation from Cameron all the way up to St. Bernard Parish. Even, even A lot of folks don't realize it, but Rita did affect the entire coastal Louisiana. Um, and obviously some of that was uh, Katrina work as well. But in Southwest Louisiana, you know, after many public hearings, people bought into the idea that we did need stronger building codes in Calcasieu and in Cameron, and, and did the right things in adopting those standards and the elevations, although they were difficult things to do. As Ryan said earlier, one of the most, you know, the best examples, later on, I mean, I was working for Governor Jindal, and he had sent me here, you know, for Hurricane Ike to help with the evacuation, also help with the response. And uh, as many people know, after Rita, the hospital down in Cameron Parish was destroyed and we rebuilt it back using federal money and elevated it you know above this a storm surge which I think is about 12 feet somewhere around there it's about a, 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 a 15 bed hospital as I remember and uh, we sent a team of National Guardsmen and Wildlife Fishery agents out to the hospital to see if anybody had taken shelter there and uh, you know hidden in the back of the building was an alligator that had taken refuge in the building itself from the protection of the surge. And so resiliency is, as I said earlier, is a buzzword, but the reality is it's about building back stronger and better and smarter than we've done before so that we can survive these things so that the government, the federal government and industry looks at us as a place that they know can survive a storm. That's what you want. And that's what brings the community back stronger. And as it's been already mentioned earlier, I mean, Cameron Parish after I came back much quicker in parts of Southern because you came back a lot faster. Um, and so I think we've learned those lessons and we're ready to kind of go forward into the future in a very strong future, obviously because of the economic growth that's occurred here, but also because of the way we plan to build our homes, build our roads, look at different ways of improving drainage and other things. Well, when we look at the infrastructure of these communities that were so deeply impacted, when it came to something like securing federal money to build a hospital in Cameron Parish, was that something you really had to fight for to convince people we need this because? Well, I served in, you know, I've served in three different roles through these storms. I, as the city manager going up to, with Mayor Roach um, uh, to talk to members of Congress about, you know, what, it, what life in Southwest Louisiana is like and trying to explain to them the importance of you know, why it's important to invest the recovery money into, into Southwest Louisiana. Because there were members of Congress, unfortunately, that said that, why do you want to live there? And so we had to explain the infrastructure, why the importance of it, why this is our way of life, what we do for the rest of the country. Um, and I think we made a, a very good argument um, from the local level. Then later on, you know, working with the Recovery Authority, then later on with Senator Landry as our legislative director on, around her recovery agenda, and making that case that Southwest Louisiana is just not important to the people here, but to Louisiana and the country. And I think we were able to do that in a way that made sense because we were, uh, and I think about it you know, now, fighting for our survival as a community because there were people that did not think we should rebuild, rebuild whether it was in the Bush White House or the Obama White House or whether it was Republican Democrat or Republican Congress or Republican uh, Democratic Congressman. 
all felt the same way that we had to convince them, you know, why it was important for them. And they sent, you know, about um, 13 billion dollars this way. Uh, Southwest Louisiana got about a billion and a half there, about community development block grant money, in FEMA public assistance. That number, you know, might be a little bit higher. But so, I think we were able to convince members of Congress that one, we were worth the investment, but two, we were going to be good stewards of that money to rebuild back stronger and better, so that we could survive the next storm and reduce the losses. Uh, over a period of time. Wonderful. Before we wrap up with this topic, I wanted to ask about what was it like doing the 100 plus public hearings in different parts of the state? I know um, people were frustrated. They wanted answers. They wanted solutions. And you were the, the person listening to this and communicating to them. So, so walk me through that time. Well, I mean, uh, I served with the Recovery Authority two different, two different times. One is as Director of Hazard Mitigation. And later on, when I moved back from D.C., to work with Governor Jindal as the Executive Director of Louisiana Recovery Authority. Well, what was interesting to me is, that, I mean, I, the, right after the storms, Katrina and Rita, people were extremely frustrated. And, you know, to be very frank, I mean, my job was to talk to people about the advisory base flood elevations and all these different communities, get the communities to adopt them so that we could continue to receive federal money. It was a benchmark that the White House had set for us to receive certain dollars. And uh, so I think we, uh, of the 13 communities that were affected, I, 10 uh, uh, adopted those advisory-based flood elevations. Since then, everyone's adopted them. To, and so we received all the money. Um, so those were very difficult conversations to have with people because it did affect some people's lives permanently. There's no doubt about that. And it did, as was stated earlier, it has affected a, a, a way of life. In the second round, when I came down as the Executive Director of the Recovery Authority, it was around the Road Home Program and their frustration around the bureaucracy. Those public hearings became invaluable for me to go and just listen and then go back and make policy changes. We made over 200 policy changes within the Road Home Program. Some people would say, well, that's, you know, that's not good. To me, it was listening to the public to making the, the changes to make it easier for people to access the money. Because for us, it was about giving people the money to make sure that they stayed here in Louisiana and reinvested in the community. Dave, back to you now. <laughs> Let's go back to talking about uh, the different employees that were part of FEMA, and, and it's still some are today, and how you've seen the transition from part-time or more temporary workers, some that you might have even coined amateur, to professional workforce now. Uh, okay, before I get into this one, I have to state that I'm not here representing FEMA. I'm here representing David Phillips. These are my opinions, by the way, not policy. So, having said that, I first logged on to FEMA in 2004 as a rank amateur. Uh, I was a Coast Guard auxiliarist. They had four storms in Florida. They needed help. We went over, took a three-day class on how to be a uh, community relations person, specialist, I guess. And then we deployed to Florida and worked two, two hurricanes. Um, didn't have a clue. At the end of two months, I kind of knew what I was doing, however. And then uh, comes Rita. Uh, I logged off of FEMA. I'd gone back to my, 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 I guess, private life, what you call it. And then after Rita, uh, my name came up in a conversation with a FEMA person and Dick Grimion, who I don't know whether to thank him or blame him. Okay. And I was hired on immediately as an intergovernmental affairs specialist for the three coastal parishes, Cameron, Vermilion, and Iberia. Again, not having a clue as what that was or what to do. Uh, guidance was to get out, go to the meetings, take the notes, get the questions, come back, find the answers, get back to the people. And of course, a big laundry list of telephone numbers. Uh, after doing that uh, for a while, it became very apparent that housing was going to be the problem, so I kind of morphed into a housing person and put in trailer parks and that kind of thing we don't want to talk about. Uh, then I was hired on as the director of the Southwest uh, Louisiana Field Office. Again, not having much of a clue, but I did have a book. This was my best friend in that job. and. I can commiserate with my buddy here about 
town hall meetings, school board. School board meetings are worse than town hall meetings, by the way. <laughs> Um, I mean, it's, they're the, they're, that's where the power is in these parishes, is the school board. Anyway, so we did that, uh, and at the, end of, at the end of all of that, uh, FEMA changed the so-called DAE, Stafford Act employees, uh, disaster assistance uh, employees, to, a, to the reserve program we currently have now. What that means is all the DAEs had to reapply for their own jobs or, or what, what jobs they thought they were qualified to do. I applied for three different positions that I actually had experience doing and I was hired as a assistant, so I've got to get it, get it straight here, a, a um, assistant trainee for the housing and uh, individual and housing program. That's what it was. I was a trainee. So I went through the training programs. I did the, the service. You had to do two or three different disasters. You had to have several different uh, things that you had to do to qualify and, and you got rated and you went before a board. And now I am a fully certified applicant assistance program specialist. I sit and work one-on-one -on -one with applicants in the, the disaster recovery centers and I love it. It's the best job I ever had. So if any of you want to go to work for FEMA, check me out. I'll be happy to give you some information about how to get that done. So we have a professional workforce now. We also have FEMA Corps, which is uh, people that, that are 18 to 24 that think they might want to get into the disaster management business uh, as a career. Uh, they're brought on board as permanent employees for 10 months, assigned to different uh, um, jobs and so forth and hopefully we then go on and further their education in disaster management. We also have surge employees. These are other uh, people from the other agencies within the Department of Homeland Security that are identified to deploy with FEMA when FEMA deploys. Uh, and there are uh, also surge employees from other, uh, other federal agencies as well. So the workforce now, uh, the only thing that saved my self <laughs> Uh, at the uh, director's job was people like Claire and about 350 other people that were hired here locally, trained up, went to work, learned their jobs, and did them for two years. So we have, and those people of course have, a lot of those people are still working with FEMA today in different jobs, and thank goodness for them. So. Do you feel like there are enough employees if, God forbid, another disaster were to strike? Well. I think FEMA is authorized something like 12,000 reservists and the, the number of actual people on board seems to hover uh, around eight or 9,000 people coming, people going, people uh, logging on, doing the training and then not being deployed for a certain period of time. It's not a career type job where you're gonna go in and make a living doing it. It's, it's, a, it's a perfect job for people that are retired and still have energy. But um, right now, when I deploy, I've got a computer, I've, got the, I've already got my, my FEMA computer, my FEMA phone, my FEMA badge. I can go directly to a DRC without having to stop anywhere along the line and go to work the next day. Or the same day if I get there early enough. And that's, that's the whole purpose of keeping everybody up to that level. That's a big difference from what it was before. Amen. All right. Ryan, back to you. One thing you hit on earlier was um, talking about some of the recovery in Cameron Parish now looking at where it's an exciting time when we talk about the economy and LNG facilities. Tell us um, some of the things that have gone right and maybe some of the shortfalls that have happened. Well, you know, I think that uh, any time that a local government or a, or a parish can diversify their economy, that is, that is a great thing. And at times we may, as a parish, we may have relied a little too heavily on oil and gas, and we weren't prepared um, for something to to hinder that industry. What we have, what we are experiencing today, and I guess it worked for Mr. Phillips, so I'm going to say it too. Uh, I am a, an employee of the Cameron Parish Police Jury. <laughs> I do not have any opinions that uh, are coming directly from the elected officials. This is just my personal opinion. They're in an election year, so take it easy on them. <laughs> uh, we, uh, 
right now today, Creole Nature Trail, tourism, uh, some great numbers coming in, over 200,000 visitors a year coming into Cameron on the Creole Nature Trail, that's documented. Rockefeller Refuge, their 2014 statistics, which Rockefeller is located in the extreme southeastern corner of Cameron Parish, in the community of Grand Chenier, which is where, where I reside. Um, again, over 200,000 individuals that are documented. So what Mr. Rainwater discussed earlier, uh, talking about how you need to educate the public, it's something that we didn't do well in previous generations. We wanted to stay to ourselves. We were independent, self-sufficient. The less people knew about what we were doing in Cameron, the better off we were. Uh, and and it, I was raised that way and I respect some of it. But there comes a point in time where you also have to stand up for yourself. And you don't have to uh, justify your existence uh, to individuals who don't know anything about you. But you also have to tell your story. So getting back to the tour, now we have tourism. Now we have $30 billion in LNG expansions that are ongoing and another $24 billion that are in permitting. Chenier LNG in the southwestern corner of Cameron Parish, as I have been told, is the single largest private industrial investment in the history of the United States. Uh, someone may be able to prove me wrong on that and I'll quit saying it, uh, <laughs> but until they do, I'm gonna run with it. Uh, it's a great thing for the parish. Now, why would the parish allow itself to fall into the same pitfalls as it did previously with the oil, with the oil industry? Uh, again, crude oil is, is, it has dropped, it is somewhat uh, rising. We have a serious issue in the parish today. Uh, we have those same LNG companies that are going to be very profitable for us. They've increased the wages for individuals in the parish. Uh, they've increased the number of jobs, even the number of support services. Uh, would we like to see more local people be employed? Absolutely. Uh, again, we're, we are now working with the school board and Suella to develop some more workforce development initiatives, getting these kids when they're in high school, have, the, have professors Skyped in, uh, and it's gonna provide an opportunity for them to begin, uh, much like the, the training program for FEMA. They're gonna begin a career uh, while they're still being educated. I think that's a, that's a very good thing for our young people. It may allow them to become generational residents like, like Scooter and I. Uh, so again, now we have tourism that is starting to blossom in the parish. Uh, we have LNG industry that is ongoing. We still have a top 10 fishing port in the entire country. We're still a top 10 beef producing parish in the state of Louisiana. We have the second highest median household income in the entire state of Louisiana, uh, only behind Ascension Parish, and we're two, we, our average house, our median household income is sixty-five thousand dollars a household. So our people aren't afraid to work. Uh, Mom and dad both work. The, the children are brought up that way, <clears throat> and I think for us, the the list of accomplishments are starting to increase themselves in, in a place where most people will say, "Why? Why? Why, Cameron?" Why would this be happening now? Uh, and I wish that we could take some of the credit for that. But the fact of the matter is, at the end of the day, uh, we've had a, a few challenges. Uh, living a secluded, isolated life at times, although very beneficial in some ways, uh, was also a, a hindrance in some instances. So today, I think that we have, we have done a, a decent job of telling our story uh, we have put some mechanisms in place. The parish has developed, after the uh, police jury commissioned a Cameron Parish comprehensive plan for coastal restoration and protection. It's, it is a uh, plan that we set down with drainage board members, landowners, fishermen, residents, and came up with some uh, in-depth projects without the, with, with, without the restriction of a dollar value. We're gonna sit down and we're gonna discuss what is important for our parish. How do we save this area for the next generation in dealing with coastal uh, erosion, shoreline erosion, uh, subsidence, so forth and so on. So we have, we have a plan that has been adopted. Uh, we have gone back to the CPRA as part of their 2017 coastal master plan submission. And we have already had some victories uh, as far as 
uh, water control structures that aren't very prevalent in the southeastern portion of the state, but water control structures are very beneficial in Cameron Parish. Um, Saltwater intrusion is one of the major issues that we have in, you know, in the coastal arena. And it's one thing to create marsh, but it's another thing uh, to not hinder uh, the salt water from affecting that marsh. So basically what we're trying to do now is protect the studs of the house and then come back and put the flat screen TV and the sofa in later, just kind of doing it reverse. Um, at the end of the day, uh, in, 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 in my honest opinion, I think that the majority of our successes in the parish aren't going to be tied to economic numbers and the number of structures that have been rebuilt and the number of people who have come back. Our successes are going to be in the students and their families who are going to grow, the opportunities are going to grow, and it's going to help our community moving forward. My daughter is the seventh generation of my family to grow up on the same piece of property. Our successes, we want them to be in the children, and we want them to be lasting. Very good. I want to bring you into this conversation, Scooter. He was uh, talking about land loss and, and the mechanisms in place to protect that. Tell me how it's impacted the refuge. Sure. As everyone can hear, we should have hired Ryan. He, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but uh, he, he's very knowledgeable. Actually, we did. Ryan was a student. At, at Rockefeller. Uh, True story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, back in 1914, uh, the refuge was deeded to the state of Louisiana from the Rockefeller Foundation through E.A. McElhaney. And so, uh, which was a very good deal for the state. It is now self-generating and self-supporting. Uh, there's no tax revenue, there's no license sales, it maintains everything through that deed of donation, which a lot of it came from oil and gas. And it is protected, uh, but one thing that's not protected is, is the land, and, and we're having a rough time to push projects to save that property. And, and our coastline exists of shell hash, which doesn't exist throughout all of Southwest Louisiana, but is, is predominant of uh, shell hash in the Rockefeller Refuge area. And what it does, it continues to roll back and it's an everyday event and, and, and it smothers the vegetation and, and then the erosion comes in. But the problem we have with, with presenting a project like that and how important it is, which our coastline is the first line of defense. And the, the problem is it's, it's the perception it's hurricane damage, okay? So every time you, you bring it up, so that happens during the hurricane, no, this is this is everyday event. So you you you've got to continue to educate, and and we we just hired a public information officer that that we're trying to get that message out. We're trying to do some streamlined footage showing the process and what's happening and and where we need to be. And and uh, but then the the next question comes up is well that's that's way down there. It, it, that's how does that affect Calcu, Vermilion, or you know other places? Well, as we lose this coastline, we're actually losing the infrastructure, the pipelines. All this becomes a factor as well as when you have the big rain events where people are flooding just recently, I think in Lake Charles was, was an issue. Well, at your coastline, the hydrology begins to change. The cuts that were once open to drain are no longer open you know, or they're open now to where you have salt water moving in. We're not fortunate as Southeast to have the Mississippi flushing a tremendous amount of fresh water as a buffer. Uh, Southwest, what we've learned to maintain, you have to protect and then you restore. So uh, we're trying our best. The project is very, very expensive. Uh, our substrates aren't able to hold uh, like you see in other parts. I know Holly Beach has a set of breakwaters and, and I think a lot of people are aware of the, the benefits from it. But in our area, uh, we got to be careful what we put. So it's a big engineering uh, process and, and, and to try to achieve what's going to be the right uh, platform to put this rock on or whatever protection we can set. And we, we've got some good information. Uh, 
it's just hard to get it to take off, you know, because of the price tag that goes along with it. Well, what do you anticipate happening in your lifetime? Uh, I, I do foresee we're going to achieve it. We're, we're going to see something placed out there to save and maintain what we have. Uh, once we we see that, then we can start really focusing on how to restore what we have lost. But, uh, you know, we, we see so many projects that are are costly that are being implemented internally, which are important, there's no doubt about it. But they're just at the stake of being lost, just like everything around it. If we don't first focus on the coastline and protect it. Very good, thank you, Scooter. All right, well, as these gentlemen have mentioned, um, there is such pride in this community and there it's home. Tell me, Paul, when it's come to you negotiating with different levels of government about is it worth all of this effort? Is it worth all of these millions and billions of dollars to rebuild and restore and implement these new projects? What do you say to that? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, from the first day of the storm, uh, a negotiation begins about which neighborhoods get water first, which neighborhoods get electricity, which fire station, which police station, and it just kind of starts from there. Uh, to the point of, you know, I remember when General Honoré came in on behalf of the president and sitting down with members of the Cameron, Calcasieu delegation just to talk about what was happening. I had worked with General Honoré's staff a bit, and um, I'll never forget, he cleared the room and he said, Rainwater, why don't you stay? He said, um, I need to, we need to get Andy on the phone. I, I didn't know quite who he was talking about. I thought he was talking about Andy Copeland, Governor Blanco's chief of staff. And he got uh, Andy Card on the phone, the president's chief of staff. And he said, uh, hey, Andy, he said, we got a problem down here. He goes, uh, that $2,000 of individual assistance we've been giving people over Katrina, we got to give them to Rita, too. And that was a negotiation that had occurred right then and there between the local governments and the president's representative. And they had won because we ended up getting the $2,000. Then you move on to the, you know, to much more complex things about what gets rebuilt, what doesn't. Um, you know, we talked earlier about the resiliency piece, piece of it. I remember meeting with, you know, the director of the president's office of management and budget when I was working for Senator Landrieu about a $25 million cost share for Southwest Louisiana. And the conversation went like this. I think that people in Southwest Louisiana need to have some skin in the game. And Senator Landrieu had, had me in the meeting representing her. She had to go to another meeting. And I said, they're there. That's their skin in the game. That's their way of life. That's their skin in the game. They're going to be there, and what you invest in the community will be there and will be taken care of. And he ended up waiving the $25 million. Uh, is it all worth it? Yes, it is. And I think if you look at Southwest Louisiana, and you have to go back to what this community did for victims of Katrina in taking care of people, and the things that this community did for the victims of Katrina came back to them when the federal government looked down at Southwest Louisiana and said, this is a place worth investing. And I think, I mean, Southwest Louisiana is just a great community. Of course, I'm biased because I was raised in De Quincey, went to McNeese. But uh, if you look at the economy and the growth, I mean, most of the announcements we made when I was with the governor's office, of the $80 billion, a good uh, two-thirds of it's here in Southwest Louisiana. So absolutely, it's worth it. When you look at what's changed just um, even like on a cosmetic structure, when you look at the houses, when you look at the elevation, when you look at um, some of the different businesses, uh, the different infrastructure improvements, what do you see now 10 years later? Well, I mean, what people talk about when they come over to like Charles and I do it as well, because uh, I live in Baton Rouge now, it's the down from the downtown area all the way down to Cameron has changed so much. Uh, some of it, you know, not for I mean, there are nostalgic things that obviously we're going to lose, not just nostalgic. I mean, there, there are things, as I said earlier, permanently affect families because they have farmland they'll never be able to have a home on again. But there are so many improvements, I think, and if you look again at the economy here and the, the nature of the growth, I mean, our decisions now aren't about, I mean, we've learned so much about how to rebuild and what to do and how to plan. Uh, now it's about moving forward into the future and making sure that we take on the growth that's occurring. We use those same lessons we learned during the disasters to help plan our growth as well so that it's done right. 
so it's done in a way that doesn't impact the community in a negative way. So, I mean, I think that's where we're at now, and that's where the conversation. And after, after 10 years, if you look at the decisions that have been made in Southwest Louisiana, I think many of them have been very good, solid decisions that you know, will play out well into the future. Any, and anything in particular you would point out? Absolutely. I, I think the, the, uh, the discussion about coastal restoration and planning, I think um, where we place our schools at in, you know, in, in Cameron and in, in Calcasieu, uh, I think the, the nature of economic development and workforce development, I think our partnerships after the storm with Southwest, uh, Southeast Texas, for example, have played huge roles into this you know, the, the, the industrial development that's occurred uh, and the sharing of workforce and the sharing of, of ideas between Southeast Texas have, have you know, and obviously they're a competitor, but there's also synergies there that make, just make huge sense in the way we do things. Okay. At this point, our four gentlemen have the opportunity to add any other thoughts before we conclude or if there's something that maybe you heard someone else point out that you wanted to build off of, now's your opportunity. Well, you know, I think just back to Dave's point about, I mean, we as a state and as a, and I think even looking at the federal government have learned so much about how to respond to disasters. Um, you know, we learned after Katrina and what we did in Southwest, Southwest Louisiana after Rita. Um, then you had Gustav and Ike and the BP oil spill. All those lessons built on each other. Um, I worked on some task force groups and, um, and the U.S. House of Representatives and the Senate after Hurricane Sandy in looking at legislation to, you know, how do we respond better and how do we provide the tools, how does the federal government provide the tools for communities to get back up quicker? Um, and I think that, you know, the federal government did listen to the voices in Louisiana and they did look at how we responded here uh, after Hurricane Rita in Southwest Louisiana, long-term planning, all those sort of you know, very, you know, sort of monotonous exercises we went through, but we came up with a final product, and I think that final product sort of speaks volumes about who we are as a community. How do you compare Hurricane Audrey to Hurricane Rita's recovery throughout Cameron Parish? Audrey, Audrey was the storm uh, for our residents in, in 1957. Um, the only, one of the major differences uh, recovery-wise was the fact that our residents were allowed to remain on their family land post Audrey. Uh, that allowed them to work longer hours in rebuilding their homes and renovating the homes. Uh, they lived for months though uh, in tents provided by the, by the Red Cross but on their private property and the families would get together and, and reconstruct one home and then move on to the next one. Uh, post Rita, it was a little different. Um, we were staying in New Roads, Louisiana, which was two and a half hours away from Cameron. Uh, we were allowed entry around 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning, and we were forced out of the parish around uh, 6.30, 7 o'clock in, in the afternoon. So it was mainly daylight. It was uh, a look and, look and leave uh, uh, type policy that was a little difficult for some of our residents uh, to capitalize on on what little bit of structure some some of the residents had. Uh, had we been able to have more access uh, to the properties, it, there could have been a chance for uh, some structures to be saved. Uh, the major difference between both storms, however, is it's uh, devastation is devastation. It, it could be to a different degree. It could be due to wind, due to water. But the life loss in Audrey, over 500 lives uh, that were lost, that was more trying than coming back and seeing uh, studs present at a, at a home place. Um, it, almost, it, it almost protected our residents uh, from the psychological effects of, of losing everything you own. You still had each other and there was solace in that. Do you think the state's mitigation work is complete? And if not, what else needs to be done? Well, I mean, we've got uh, the, the basic tenets of a mitigation plan. Uh, we, you know, build homes higher. We have tougher building codes for communities uh, and that are within, you know, the uh, most, uh, you know, wind zones, the most hazardous wind zones. But I think if you look at mitigation from a holistic perspective, the next phase is coastal restoration. 
and um, you know building levees where levees are needed to be built, uh, re, re, uh, doing marsh so that you know hurricane winds and, and water are stopped by you know, the the marshes themselves uh, as a as you know mitigation itself. So that's the next phase of it, and I think the state uh, is in pretty decent shape as it moves forward with the BP money that was given to the state as part of the settlement, and I think the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority has adopted. Um, a really good plan that's ready to move forward on. What are some of the changes FEMA's made since the Hurricanes Rita and Katrina? Gosh, I've got a book full of them. It major changes all the way from the very top to the bottom uh, in the manpower, uh, the partnerships with uh, governmental agencies, other governmental agencies, uh, all the way down to the local government level. It's just, uh, it's too many. Actually, I've got a 60-page document here that just is a recap of the changes uh, in the way FEMA does business nowadays. What do you feel are the most important lessons learned? Well, one of the lessons learned, of course, is on the large disasters, is it's just not going to ever come easy for us. Uh, we're 10 years into this uh, disaster and almost finished with the, uh, a lot of the uh, public construction projects, but it just takes a long time to get things like they were. Uh, we, uh, we always try to manage people's expectations and let them know that it does take a while. Uh, but, uh, of course, everybody wants it done now, done quickly. And, of course, that's our, our goal is to do it 